So, we are now at the 15th of April, Wednesday, second to the last lecture in this class. And we're going to do salinity today, which directly follows up the water relations. And then we're going to do start on root system studies in these last lectures. Uh, as a note, I have now sent the key back to everyone for homework number eight. And I, my intention is to send you your scores. Some people did fine, but it's, it's the kind of thing I'll ask on the final exam. So you want to make sure, if you didn't get it right, that you can. So salinity is in the textbook in the chapter nine. You can tell we're getting toward the end because the chapter numbers are getting higher on stress physiology. And as I've said before, we teach whole classes on stress physiology. This is just a little tiny subset of that. Let's look at salinity. So to analyze the effect of salinity on the whole thing, it's worth it to start with a little diagram of the soil plant atmosphere continuum, which we draw this many times. And we put our leaves in here. And if something like this, and now we're talking about the water moving through here, up the stem, out in the air. And you ought to be able to calculate this driving gradient and the fluxes that determine the size of this arrow and the driving gradient that sucks the liquid water up to the top from the soil. So let's put on here psi and I'll put W for water, in the soil is matrix, and then it's all drawn up. And of course, we calculate an equivalent water potential of the air from the vapor pressure deficit. And psi here, psi W, equals psi um, solute potential or osmotic potential plus pressure potential or turgor in the plant. All right, so here's the components driving this through. All of a sudden, into this, we bring in plus. Oh, we got to put this in a different color. Dun, da, da, dun. Put this psi salinity or solute potential in the root zone. Suddenly, this whole system has another weight added to it because the water in the soil is bound not only to the particles of the soil, but the salt. And we teach this without any salinity, and plants look like they have it good, and they still have challenges even when there's no salinity, because just let's, let me draw this again. What if we draw a little tiny graph of this, and this is noon, this is dawn and dusk. And this is transpiration, transpiration rate. Look at this. This graph is going to look like that. And the transpiration rate is exceptionally high in the middle of the day. It's hard enough to get water to flow through this thing fast enough to keep the plant from wilting. And now we add salinity. And this whole thing is even harder in the, in the middle of the day. So remember that PWP, show that one in brown, permanent wilting point is minus 1.5 megapascals. Important number to remember. Seawater. I think we talked about this once before, is minus 2.4 <coughs> megapascals. So this is a matrix potential, but clearly seawater alone, just seawater, exceeds the permanent wilting point of a plant, which is why it's so hard to grow plants um, <coughs> with saline water. Um, if you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you listen to my TED talk, 
uh, you uh, emphasize how much water there is. Let me put this up here. This is a <clears throat> graphic off the internet that <coughs> says if all the Earth's, Earth's water fit in a gallon jug, the available fresh water would only be <clears throat> a teaspoon of water. 97% of the water is seawater, 2% is ice, 0.7% is groundwater, and the fresh water is only 0.3% of the total. But that keeps recycling and it feeds all of agriculture. But that's why salinity is so critically important. If plants can take a little more salinity, we can access a lot more water. And in the arid west, it doesn't rain a lot, we have a lot of saline soils. Um, the big agricultural areas of Southern California have a lot of saline soils. The rivers pick up salts all the way down there. So, the first point that I'm going to make really clear is the enormously high variability among species. And I'll put a couple of these on the board. There are many charts. If you type this in on the internet, you'll get hundreds of tables and rankings. I'm going to show you the one that I like best, which is right here. And let's see, Crop Selection Guide for Saline Soils. This is, fills the screen, and I will send you this as a handout. But across here is the salinity, and then different crops are written in here to emphasize it. So this is a single graphical table to emphasize this high variability. The units written in here big are conductivity, electrical conductivity. I'm, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to spend some time on that unit, how we measure it, how to interpret the data. It's really easy to measure. You can buy a meter for home use and check it everywhere, unlike some other things which you have to send to a lab. But here is really low salinity. Like our tap water, I think it's point, point 0.3. So our tap water, Logan tap water, is real, just barely on here. But after a while, salts build up. Way down here in the corner is fruit crops. Fruit crops, pear, apple, plum, peach, including strawberries, those are our most sensitive crops. And a little bit of salinity, and these go downhill fast. They can still grow, but, the, but they take a big hit on yield. So we don't grow our fruit crops in saline soils. They just can't tolerate it. If we jump all the way to the other end, and for the moment, never mind the units, wheat grass and barley, whoa, those crops are tough as nails. And those people are working on breeding barley to be able to irrigate it with salt water. And believe me, when they do this, they want to keep those soils really wet. So there's not any additional matrix potential, but they have plenty of water, so they just keep them wet all the time. And we're working on it. It's, it even barley takes a yield hit if the, if the salinity is high. So studying this, green beans are also really sensitive. Squash is sensitive. Certain kinds of clover, many kinds of clover are sensitive, but where's alfalfa in here? Alfalfa, here's forage crops, much better. Tall fescue, much better. We have a lot of saline lands, then, and we're growing tall fescue on them. We're sure not growing clover on them. Field crops, beans really sensitive, including soybeans, um, corn and oats, wheat and rye, sugar beets, barley, and then vegetable crops, one, two, three, four categories. Beets are really tolerant of salinity, and cucumbers, radish, um, beans, really sensitive. So what's the mechanism? How do crops get tolerant of salinity 
if everything follows the rules of these negative numbers, salinity is not like matrix potential because salinity is virtually always sodium and chloride. There's other salts that contribute, but 99.9% .9 of the problem is just sodium chloride. These ions can go in the plant. Now, unlike the soil particles, they're not going in the plant. So in the crops that are tolerant, they do one of two things. Either the plant accumulates solutes to become even more salty than the solution, so it can still draw water in, or it takes these ions up and the Na and the chloride go right in the plant and the plant just tolerates the high salt. Some, some crops even grow in ocean water and so they're even, they're, they're becoming, uh, they have a lower osmotic potential than the solution out here and they can, they can tolerate it. Um, not easy to do but if the other alternative is death, well, better to take high salinity. So in that sense, quite a bit different than uh, just regular matrix potential. By the way, because this whole thing is water potential, if we looked at this, this would be minus, what, 3.9 megapascals. Just as an example, because these are summed, so if we did have seawater and it got dry, we're at minus one and a half. Or we're at minus 3.9 for what the plant sees. Now let's look at measurement of salinity and the units in this thing. This is a wonderful graph to show you relative effects, but quantitatively, how do you know how much salinity you have? And one way is take a sample soil and send it to the lab, but I will show you how to measure this. This chart is conductivity of saturation extract in millimoles per centimeter. So now let's go over here and we have arranged to do a demo of this. Here's some soils. Here's a meter. This, these are just two meters, same thing. What, they have different ranges. This is an electrical conductivity meter. They're cheap, real accurate, hardly ever need calibration. I think these meters are way underutilized in the, in the quest to understand salt in soils or any, any plant. I use them all the time in my house plants, checking the leachate of the water. I want it to be a little fertilizer, not too much. And if it's too little, I add more. If it's too much, I leach the pot. And it's pretty simple, but it sure helps your house plants. This particular one, we've, we've got some papers on the internet about EC meters. This particular one is made by HANA, H-A-N-N-A instruments. And this is the, there's cheaper ones, more expensive ones. These are about $50. And they have two, if you can see right here, they have two pins down here and a battery. And you put it in water. Here's some Logan tap water. Put it in water and it measures the electrical conductivity of the water. So it's dead simple and um, really, as I said, really, really accurate. But so this is pretty easy to measure water. Now, how are we gonna do this in soil? Let's talk about the units here. Um, units are super confusing. You think units of pressure are bad and feet and inches and Celsius and Fahrenheit. Units of conductivity all can be interconverted, but lots of people use all kinds of units. The SI unit for conductivity is the semen, 
one of, one of the more obscure units, maybe. And conductivity is also over some distance. So EC, electrical conductivity, is, would be Siemens per meter. Almost nobody uses the SI unit, even though it's a clear unit. But we're getting there. Um, this is one of the most amazing stories about units. The unit for resistance in electricity is the ohm. And that's a pretty basic unit. As soon as you do anything with electricity, you learn about ohms of resistance, OHM. So if we're doing conductivity, it's just the inverse of the resistance. It's the model conductivity, one over the resistance. In this case, it would be one over ohms is the conductivity, and the SI unit is the semen, which the one that, MEN. So what you see all the time on conductivity is a unit called MHOS, Mohs. Hmm. What if we took the word ohm and spelled it backwards? Ah, that's some, somebody that wasn't following the rules of SI units decide we'll just call it conductivity Mohs, and Mohs is a unit, not Siemens. Wow, so that's led to years of confusion. But in, it's a, another chart, because this is so confusing, we made a chart of conversions. We'll come back to this. And this is conversions among units for, uh, let me get this other stuff out of here, um, for electrical conductivity. Look at this. Not everybody uses meters in the denominator. We often use per centimeter. Okay. And there's Siemens, and there's Mohs, and there's Micro Siemens, there's Deci Siemens. Um, but Siemens is the SI unit. Mo is Siemens spelled backward, is Ohm spelled backwards. Um, and one Siemens is one Mo. Wow, that's convenient. <laughs> so it's 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 a one-to-one -one relationship. But with multiple units here. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six common units for EC. They all vary by a factor of 10. Uh, actually, some of them are a factor of 1,000 because there's milli and micro. Um, but you can all interconvert, and that's just a table to convert among them. So let's take a look before we, I'm going to convert to um, water potential right here from Mohs and Siemens to water potential. But first, let's look at how we measure it. If you send your soil sample, by the way, here is Logan tap water, I'll tilt it, 372, um, this is micro Siemens per meter. So how close did we get to this? Tap water, this is Logan tap water now. Our tap water is real high quality. Micro Siemens per meter. Oh, micro Siemens is, or micro Siemens per centimeter. Uh, right here, 350. Right now we're getting 372. So it varies a little bit. Um, this is an estimate. Now, then this, this tells you the unit right in the top. Now. We want to measure salinity of soil. Here's a beaker for measuring it. We're not going to get anything. It's dry soil. There's not enough water. It's zero. There's not enough water to conduct electricity. So here's how we do it. Take the soil. We pour water into here. And we keep pouring it in. 
there we go, until it is saturated. And it looks pretty good. It, it turns it to mud. Not any extra, just it's just glistening with water on the top. And now we put the meter in here, and now we get a reading. Now, in this particular one, we didn't put any salt in. But this is how we do it, and it gives us a value for conductivity. What did we get with this thing? Yeah, this one's, this one's really low. I, mean, I should put some salt in here, and then it'll go through the roof. Um, but, but we have to add water. Now let's go back to our original chart with saline soil right here. Two, four, eight. What we would like to do is convert from this conductivity of that saturated extract to water potential, to solute potential. And this is really, this is one of the easiest equations, except for units. I guess all equations are easy except for units. Water potential equals the EC times 40. Now, we don't have units here. We don't have units here. Let me make sure I've got my units right. When this is milli siemens per centimeter, this is water potential in kilopascals. So, yes, this is one of the common errors. Water potential is always negative. So this is, it's times a minus 40. Let's move the times back over here a little bit. This always has to be minus 40. Now this number varies a tiny bit depending on the kind of salt. It, for calcium chloride, I think it's 43, but sodium chloride is real close to 40. I guess you can see I only wrote that to one significant digit. But it's a real handy way to go from osmotic potential. Actually, sorry, this is water potential. That's not right. That's solute potential. It would be water potential if there's nothing else in there, if it's just water. But, and it can take that comma out. This is in kilopascals. Remember, this is megapascals. So how about we do times minus 0 0.04. And now this is megapascals over here. So I sub s equals milli siemens per centimeter. So if Logan tap water is 350, that's micro siemens. If we get Logan tap water into milli siemens, it's 0 0.35 milli siemens per centimeter. Here, by the way, there's two meters. Number three reads out in micro siemens per centimeter, and number four reads out in milli siemens. <clears throat> and they're both, this is a great range for stuff that's not very salty, and this is a much better range for stuff that is salty. This first meter that only goes to 2,000, it would only measure this range right here. This other meter goes to, uh, what's the high end? It goes to 20, so it goes off scale. This one would give you, this number four would give you this entire range up here. But to give you a sense of how good our tap water is, we say it's really alkaline, but it's not salty. 0.35 minus 0.04, it's a tiny number. And this will give us solute potential in megapascals. There's a times in here, thank you. Times, and that's negative, yep. So our 
tap water is. What did you get? 0.014. Yeah. We'll round it off. 0.01 megapascals. And even if we rounded it up on a bad day, we'd have 0.02. Still fine. So we, we can, we, we're in good shape in Logan. Unlike a lot of other places on the planet where they have real saline irrigation water. But this is, this is how it's calculated. And this I will send you on a, on a, this handout here. Let's put this up here again. Um, here's the equation to get kilopascals. Here it is to get megapascals going back and forth. And then to make it really easy, here's a lookup table, which I have found handy. And it's water potentials of sodium chloride solutions at temperatures from 5 to 35 C in moles of salt per kilogram of water. And remember, kilogram and liter, about the same. So you can see, if you start adding more salt, and I don't know if you can see this, minus 1.5, which is right in here, is permanent wilting point. So it doesn't take many moles of salt to get it to permanent wilting point. And that's just a lookup table. And this, by the way, is from our equation. Solute potential is concentration times ions times RT. We talked about that in the last lecture. Another handout. Back to this. Here's one of the problems of this test. This is a saturation extract. And we do the math. And this is minus 0.08 megapascals. Well, that's hardly any salt. And we go all the way up to here. And most plants are struggling. And it's only minus 0.5 megapascals. Why does this look so toxic? And even up here, minus 0.64 megapascals. When we do this conversion, here's the problem. And we have to go back over here. We just diluted all the salts to make this saturation paste extract. The salts are in here, and they're more dilute because we had to flood the soil to measure them. What happens if we let this sit for a while and the water evaporates? Ooh, if half the water evaporates, the salts can't, don't evaporate. They get concentrated. So that's a key principle. As the soil starts to run out of water, the, this shoots up really fast. And as soon as this runs out of water, doubles, triples, quadruples. So boy, you've got to be on roller skates to keep soils irrigated that are saline, because this, this concentrates. It's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. And we have whole classes in management of saline soils. We try to leach them to get the salts, push the salts down in the root zone. But um, you're leaching with saline water. It's, it's just a complicated thing. All right. This is how to interpret the data. These charts give you relative sensitivities of, of uh, crops. If the world runs out of water, well, one solution is we're going to start eating a lot more beets. And we won't have garden beans anymore because we don't have the water for them. Either that or the beans and celery and radish and cucumber and squash, those prices will shoot up. And everybody will be going spinach, spinach asparagus, kale, beets, stuff that's tough as, as nails. We'll shift what we grow. Um, I, this sounds nuts, but I think we really could get to this point because we're going we're gonna to run out of water. I think, oh, one other thing that before I leave this. How about the plants that grow in the ocean? You just said seaweed. Yes. Let's look at this. That's a good question. Let's look at that. Let's, how about fish? There are fish grow in the ocean. Some Seagulls. Some fish can. <laughs> Let's what, look what plants do. Let's turn to animal physiology, third edition. 
guess what? There's a section in the animal physiology on how to, pl how to fit, uh, plants in the ocean do this. Here's fish, and they do it the same way plants do. They just get more salty than the ocean water, so osmotically, they gotta follow all these rules. Animals follow the same rules as people, sort of microorganisms. Here's a freshwater, this is a teleostat. I don't know that fish, but here's a marine teleostat and how it gets more salty so it can tolerate. And I love this picture. Here is a seagull, seawater, the nasal fluid of a seagull, the urine of a seagull. A seagull can get water from the ocean. Here's what happens when we try it. It's, it can't get, we can't get water from the ocean. Our urine is a lot less salty than seawater. We just, we just can't do it. Um, so plants that grow in the ocean can tolerate real high levels of salt in their tissues. Um, they don't grow as fast, though, either. Which, let's take a look at types of plants and strategies. I think I'll put this on the board. This is a good time to do a transition. Um, crop plants, if, if this was, if, if I was an investment counselor, I would say crop plants are a high risk investment. They have high returns and they're high risk. So well, let's do a thing here. Risk, high. Return, high. Crop plants. They are, and especially with breeding, they're bred for life in the fast lane. Just high inputs, high outputs. How about cam plants? They're just about the opposite. Risk low, return low, cam plants as, a, as the opposite extreme. There's another strategy in here too. Little desert annual plants. They're small. I'm going to put desert annuals. They're little tiny flowers. They have a real short life cycle. It rains in the spring and they germinate and they grow. They set a few seeds and then they die. But they made it. They propagated themselves because they set a few seeds. So I guess we could say that they're also um, lower risk return just because they're never going to have we're pretty hard to feed ourselves with desert annuals but they just go through their life cycle super fast how about trees you know they're they live a long time low risk low return and I, this is like jardine juniper um, so it gives you a sense of categories, but crop plants are unique in uh, how they, they designed to grow really fast. So we had some time left, and I am done with salinity. Let's segue into chapter 10 which is, these are shorter chapters, root morphology and drought resistance. So if we take, the contents of a plant physiology textbook. Uh, I don't think I have a plant physiology textbook in here, but here's the table of contents. Let me put it up here get it bigger. Can't see the whole thing. This is from Thais and Zeiger. Many of the concepts we study are also in this book. There's basic principles, water and plant cells. We, we don't, in this class we don't talk about mineral nutrition, but, but, but water, water, solutes, 
And then biochemistry, metabolism, photosynthesis, stomata, translocation in the phloem, respiration. These are all things we talk about in whole plants. Then we go into growth and development, and this is flowering of plants. Do you see a chapter in this book on root systems? No, you do not. Plant physiology historically is just deals with the top of the plant. But for years in this lab, we use this as our logo. Mm, see if I can zoom out to get this there. There's the logo. Um, get rid of that. Sunlight top, we spin a big part of the plant, boom, look at all this down here that's supporting the top of the plant, and we hardly ever talk about root systems. They are super hard to study, which is why we don't talk about them much, but we are developing techniques to get better at studying root system, and some of my colleagues have uh, done a lot of work on uh, root systems. One in particular is Dave Eisenstadt, who is an alumni from here, got his PhD here. He's at Penn State now. He is an invited speaker all over the world on root systems, and he, and he worked on them here at Utah State University. So one of the reasons there's such a big deal, let's, let's see, let's put this right on this diagram. What do we do to make crops grow better? Well, not a lot we can do at the top. Planting density, leaf angles, but root systems, well one, get the fertilizer right. Fertilizer, right. Two, water, get the water right. These are all management things that we have complete clover. How about temperature? Can't change the temperature of the top unless you move to a different place. We put mulches on here all the time, clear mulches to get it, clear plastic to get it hot, um, heavy mulches to keep it cool. We control temperature of the root zone. Um, and then we're going to get rid of Mohs 4. Tillage. What does tillage do? Ah, it fluffs up the soil, changes the ratio of oxygen, O2, and H2O. Remember, it's, we can't get enough uh, oxygen if it has to go through water, so we've got to have lots of air filled channels. So, all four of these things are things we regularly do to soils to improve crop growth. So the, the number of things we can do is enormous. Look what happens if we walk out with a flotilla of sensors. Now we're going to make another graph. And we're going to put, this is going to be days. You can tell it's important because the graph is big. And now we're going to have a bunch of days on here. And right here in blue, we're going to have irrigation. I-R-R-I-G, irrigation. And this axis over here is going to be water potential. And it's going to be shown in some other color like red. It's going to be oxygen in the soil. So we irrigate, and the water potential, let's, we're going to do the water potential in blue, and this is going to be zero. And this goes up, we irrigate, water potential goes immediately up here to field capacity, minus 0 0.03. What happens to the oxygen? When we do that, oh, oh, the oxygen, which is getting there, by this goes down. So the oxygen right at that moment goes down. Then the soil starts to dry out. 
Well, I got a lot of markers open. Soil starts to dry out, so this water potential gradually goes down, and as that goes down, the oxygen goes up. And then we do it again. Yeah, we're out of water. So then we irrigate, and this goes up again. And you could see the inverse relationship between oxygen getting high. Let's see, oxygen's high, and then as soon as we irrigate, this drops, and that gradually goes up. They, they cycle inversely. And the whole point of tillage and drip irrigation is to try not compact the soil. So the more fluffy we can keep the soil, the, the better we can get both oxygen and water in there. Now, think about it. We work hard to keep the organic matter high, all kinds of things. Yeah, organic matter makes it fluffy, makes it so we don't have such a boom, 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 back and forth. With no organic matter, this would be terrible. Um, we fluff, we fluff, rototillers this time of year putting in gardens, we fluff it. And then what do we do? We sprinkle or irrigate and we beat it back down all summer long. So it's as a, this is a tough thing and roots, roots have to deal with that. Um, when we think about, you know how we, I might draw another plant. Um, over here, right here. Up in the top, we analyze leaf area index. And this is a big deal because it's capturing photons of sunlight coming in here. Want to get this just right? How about the bottom of the plant? How about a root area index? Root RAI. You ever see that in the literature? No, you do not. Because it's so hard to measure, but we can model it and we can model the effects of it and we can work hard to measure root area index. And as a general rule, this needs to be about a one-to-one -one ratio. Because all this water coming in, for example, that's leaving up here, it's got to come in to the surfaces of the roots on the, on the bottom, when you think about it. And guess what? If there's water stress, what do plants do? People say, oh my, the, the roots will go downhill because of water stress. No way. It's the opposite. If there's water stress, the first thing plants do is grow more roots. And of course, grow them deeper if they can. But if you get the root area to be bigger than the leaf area, the plant can take drought stress better both for density of roots and for um, area of roots. Let's look at, this is a picture out of a book with plants grown in rows. It's a simple picture. Here's a bunch of plants, dense plants in rows, nothing here. Now, in this particular study, a hardworking graduate student dug this up and this is too small to see. This is root area index right here. And here's the roots. And look, right under where they're too dense here, the roots were super dense down here. In between rows, way less roots. So if we spread the leaves out, we're making the roots more uniform in the bottom. Too. These numbers go up to 10. And one of the things we do for roots is we don't so much do root area index, but we do root density. And this is particular root length density. And here's how to think about this. This is centimeters of roots per centimeter of soil. So if we took a dice, and let me draw a giant dice right here, greatly magnified, and it's a three-dimensional dice. That's a, cu a dice is about a cubic centimeter. If the dice read one, one dot, 
and that was one centimeter of roots, that would be one centimeter of roots per centimeter of soil. If it read five, now we have five, these are dotted lines, centimeters per centimeter of soil. And this is a nice analogy because I guess a dice only goes up to six, but in dense root systems, we get an RLD, root length density, up to 10. That's about the highest numbers I've ever seen. Wow, that is a lot of dense roots. If you imagine a dice, I guess if we had nine on here, it's a lot of roots per soil. They are really extracting the resources of the soil to uh, get, the, get everything they can out of here. So what we really would like to know is surface area of roots. <clears throat> In the top of the plant, we do surface area of leaves. How are we going to get <clears throat> surface area of roots? What we can do, I'm going to put this way over here. And I think I have just enough time to, to uh, introduce this. Here's a root, really big. We can <coughs> easily measure fresh mass of the root system. Because you, it, it, not that easy. You separate the roots from the soil, but after you've done that, it can weigh the fresh weight. So we got a fresh weight, but what we're after is area of the roots. So the next thing we can do is get the length of the roots, this distance here. And that we can do with a scanner. There's lots of scanners available. You put the roots on there and the images them, and it tells you the length. And you put a piece of string on there, and it images them, it tells you the length. This is, these are commercially available scanners. You could take a picture of it in the right software. Let me draw a picture. Here's the, here's the area. Your roots don't even have to be continuous. They can be in little parts. It, tells, it adds up the length of all the lines. OK, we have fresh mass and length. What we're after is area of the roots. How can we get area? Well, we assume that this is a cylinder, which is a good assumption. You think of carrot roots and they're tapered, but roots are over, over short distances are nearly perfect cylinders. So the volume is 2 pi r times the length of the root. Mm. We don't know R, so we can't get volume. But what about surface area? Surface area of a cylinder. Pi R squared times the length and we assume not only that they're a cylinder, with these are what we measure, but the specific gravity equals one gram per cubic centimeter. Same as water, one. And this is a really good assumption, because if you put plants in water, they don't sink. They don't float. They are neutrally buoyant. So guess what? If we can, if they're a cylinder, and if they're neutrally buoyant, now the fresh weight is equal to the volume in cubic centimeters. We suddenly solve this, not solve it, we suddenly know this parameter right here. The volume of the root 
and we've measured the length, shown here in orange. Pi, you can look up the value of pi in a book. Two, we can solve this for the radius of the root by knowing the fresh weight and the length. And guess what? If we know the radius, we insert it in this equation. We know the length, we know the radius. We get surface area. From these, it's really two equations, one to give us radius and one to put it in surface area. And suddenly, we can take a bunch of roots and boom, we know the surface area of the roots. And this is how it's done. And I've got a, where'd that handout go? I've got a handout on uh, exactly how to do this. Here it is. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, this is high school geometry, but cleverly applied high school geometry. How to calculate root surface area. And here's what I just put on the board. And then rearrange the equations to solve for the radius right here. Now, if you buy a root scanner, boom, it does it all in software. And it gives you a digital readout of the surface area of your roots. But it's useful to know where that comes from and the assumptions on here. And that's a, an amazing thing. And now with these root scanners, we can get surface area of roots. So now we can, if we can get amount of roots, we can start to get at this ratio right here. I think I have a minute left. Let me show you a couple key things. There is several books on not several, a few books on root distribution. And you look them up and they have beautiful pictures like this. And, but some of our crops, let's, this is, could be alfalfa right here. Boy, alfalfa is drought tolerant, but it's not so much because it osmotically adjusts. Alfalfa has a deep taproot, and all summer long it can access deep water. Some crops, Minimal taproot, they can't take drought. Here's a fibrous root. This is just a couple examples of, uh, of roots. Carrots, oh well, yeah, with a carrot root, but the carrot root doesn't help the plant get water. That's a storage root. It's all the fine roots that come out of the carrot that really help that. That's just a quick example of uh, root distribution. Here's one other thing that's uh, key. And, and in fact, Here's a cover of the plant nutrition book that I, that I teach out of in fall semester on mineral nutrition. Here's a picture of three plants, shoots and roots, and of course it just shows the plant getting smaller. But as the plant gets more stressed, the root get more stressed in the root zone, the root zone gets relatively bigger. This might be, you can't tell from here, but this might be two to one roots to shoots. This might be one to two. Um, sorry, yeah, two to one roots to shoots. This might be 0.5 and, and one. As the root system gets better, the roots get smaller. They, they, the plant doesn't grow more roots than it needs. It grows just enough and then it puts it its effort into capturing light. This is real counterintuitive when you think about stress, but the point here is plants partition their carbon to wherever they need it the most. If you grow a plant in low light, it'll put more effort up into making more leaves. And if you grow it in water stress, it'll put more into the roots. One final graph. Better be final, because I'm out of room. Over here. This is Time. This is planting and harvest. H V S T. Harvest. This is percent roots. 
100% and zero. What's this line look like? If you ask this to somebody, they might say, oh, yeah, the plants are half roots. So I'm going I'm to call that line 50% right there. Wrong. When a seed germinates, right here, here's the ground, here's the seed. What comes out on a seed germinating? The radical, the root. So a plants always start out at 100% roots when they're germinating. And then I got to show the, the top in green. The shoot starts to grow. And by that time, the root system is big. And so this starts to go down a little bit. And it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it goes down exponentially from 100%. And when we have harvested hydroponic plants, optimal root zone, 5% roots at harvest. Hardly any roots, it didn't need them. If the plants are water stressed, this might be 30% at harvest, but, the, but if they're fertilized and watered, most crop plants are around 10% roots at harvest because they just didn't need the roots. The plant always gets ahead of itself, takes up nitrogen, water, gets big, stores it, and then the root system slowly go downhill. So this is a real nonlinear relationship between the fraction of roots here and the fraction at harvest. This is as much as, now I got all the way through root systems. The final lecture, 48 hours from now, is going to be on temperature stress and particularly freezing stress. How is it that some plants die right away if it gets cold and other plants can live in Point Barrow, Alaska with super cold? How do they do that? How do plants tolerate freezing stress? I guess if we figure that out for plants, we could freeze people, and you could go to Alpha Centauri. We haven't figured that out yet, but let me, I'll tell you next time how we do it, how plants figure it out. See you then.